Well, I began my life in ministry as a youth pastor, as many of you know, and spent roughly 10 years working with junior and senior high students. And as any student pastor will uh, let you know, Sterling or Jonathan or even uh, Bruce, Jeff worked as a student pastor, we could all tell you that when you work with adolescents, you're constantly looking for creative ways to hold their attention, to have some fun, and to simultaneously try to teach them something important about God. It's not an easy task. I tried all kinds of things. Some worked pretty well, uh, some not so much, and I could tell some of those failure stories. But one of the games slash group exercises that I tried over the years that worked beautifully every time I used it, I think I might have used it three times, uh, went like this. First you selected two or three students out of the group and moved them off to the side. And then you took the rest of the students and put them into groups of six to eight students or so. Depending on however many students you had, you had maybe six or eight groups of six to eight kids and two or three off to the side. And then uh, you'd take the two or three that were by themselves and say, okay, what I want you to do is to try to get into one of those groups. That's all I would say. I want you to try to get into one of those groups. And guess what happened? Total mayhem. Because immediately the kids that I'd put into groups would lock arms, turn their backs, show their elbows, and do everything possible to keep these other students from getting into their groups. And the students trying to get into their groups would bite and scratch and claw. And sometimes the boys would launch themselves like human projectiles. And I have to cut it off before someone got hurt uh, and I uh, lost my job. Uh, but it would be violent almost. And then the discussion would begin. Because I would then calm everybody down and I'd say, I'd ask the, uh, the kids who tried to get into the groups, okay, why did you do what you did? Why did you try so hard to get in? They said, well, because you told us to, Pastor Brian, and because we wanted to belong. I said, okay, good. And I went over to the other group, the groups. I said, now, why did you all work so hard to keep them out? And they said, because you told us to. I said, no, I didn't. I didn't say anything to you. I told them to try to get in. You could have just let them walk in, but none of you did. And then I'd ask why. And then we'd have the discussion. Isn't that kind of the way... The world is. Doesn't it seem like sometimes that the whole world is about who's in and who's out? From ethnic groups to world religions to elite universities to country clubs, sometimes even to churches. It's all about who's acceptable and who's not. Well, we're in a series right now out of the book of Acts called Breaking Barriers, Reaching Across Boundaries. And today we're going to look at a story about who's in and who's out. Now, this is a very long narrative story. I think we're going to read through 48 verses. And it unfolds kind of like a play with three acts. So I'm going to identify those three acts, and then there's, but there's so much in these, this passage, this story, that I'm going to sometimes go verse by verse so you don't miss anything, and so we'll see all three acts. Okay, let's get started. Act one in this story is God speaks to an outsider. God speaks to an outsider. Acts chapter 10, you can look in your personal Bibles, and we'll have all the verses up on the screen as well. Luke is writing, let's begin, Acts 10 verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. Now let's pause there. Caesarea is a smallish town on the coast of the Mediterranean, northwest of Jerusalem. But what's significant here is that the name itself uh, tells us uh, something about what we're going to be talking about. Because Caesarea was named after uh, the Roman emperor Caesar Augustus. And of course you remember who he was. He was the one who proclaimed the census so that a tax could be taken of the entire known world. And that forced a man named Joseph and his fiancée Mary, who was with child, to travel all the way to Bethlehem to have their baby whose name was Jesus. Caesarea reminds us right away that the Jewish world was dominated by Rome. And the, Ro and the Jews resented the Romans bitterly. Now, who was this guy? Cornelius. Uh, Luke tells us here that Cornelius was a centurion of the Italian cohort. I, I was laughing. The Italian cohort sounds like a movie or something. I've told Jeff that. But it means simply that he was an officer in the Roman army. He served in a regiment or a battalion that was stationed there in Caesarea. A cohort was about 1,000 soldiers. As centurion, he would have had uh, command over about 100 of those soldiers. So roughly the equivalent of a captain in today's army. Now, so right away, Luke is making it clear to his Jewish reading audience, that Cornelius was different. Cornelius was an outsider. We're calling this series Breaking Barriers, Reaching Across Boundaries, because Luke is giving us story after story, beginning in chapter 9, moving through this portion of Acts, 
to, uh, how, of how the gospel reaches those who would have at one time been called or considered outsiders. We see this theme in the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, persecutor of the church, arch enemy of the gospel. We see it in the story of the Ethiopian eunuch that Jeff covered last week. From a different culture, uh, elite per, uh, personal status as, uh, uh, as administrator for the queen, not to mention the whole eunuch thing. Now, that was a, a whole different set of barriers there too. And now we have a Roman centurion. Remember, it would have been Roman soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross and thrust the spear through his side to make sure he was dead. The early Christians were all of Jewish background and would have immediately seen Cornelius as one of them. He's one of them. He's a Roman. He's an outsider. And we're going to see as we go through this story that God loves the outsider as much as he loves the insider. Now, Luke tells us in verse 2 that Cornelius was also a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. Pause there again. Now, Luke is throwing a curveball to his readers, a complete curveball. See, uh, they, they were just been thinking about this guy. Okay, centurion, I got it. Cornelius is a centurion, a Roman, different, bad guy. And Luke goes on to add details like Cornelius was, uh, was a man who feared God. Okay, that doesn't compute. And he gave alms generously. That was an, an expectation of any devout Jew to share generously with those in need. And that he prayed continually to God. Notice, not the gods of the Romans, not the pagan gods and goddesses of the Romans, and they had many, but God, capital G. He was doing his best to worship and pray to the God of the Hebrews, the one God Jehovah. Now, what's Luke saying here? He's simply creating a question in the minds of his readers. Is Cornelius in or is he out? Is he one of them or is he one of us? He's a Roman. He speaks differently. He dresses differently. He even looks different than we look. But he's devout. He worships. He gives alms. He prays. Cornelius, I think, is what we would call today a spiritual seeker, that he's a seeker of God, he's a seeker of the truth, yet he's not quite yet on the inside because he does not yet know the gospel of Jesus Christ. But just as we saw with Saul of Tarsus, we see God is pursuing Cornelius. Verse 3, at about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius... So Cornelius is praying. It's about the ninth hour. And what's that mean? It means about three in the afternoon in the way Jewish, the Jews kept time. And that was the time, the hour of the evening sacrifice in the temple, which means Cornelius is observing the Jewish rituals of prayer three times a day. When I was in Dubai back in September traveling back home, uh, we had a layover uh, in the airport in Amman, Jordan. So I needed to make a quick trip to the men's room, which I did. And I walked in the men's room and saw two men uh, busy taking their shoes and socks off in a corner of the restroom, uh, preparing to wash their feet uh, from a faucet coming out of the wall. And I immediately knew they were Muslims. Why? Because Muslim men wash their hands and their feet at every hour of prayer of the Islamic call to prayer five times a day. So the way in which they prayed told me who it was that they worshipped and what their religion was. This happens as well when we look at Cornelius. He's praying and in his, vision, in his prayer he sees a vision in which an angel speaks to him by name. And this would be a shock to Luke's readers, a surprise. God speaks to an outsider? He speaks to a Roman? Now it's a, it's a surprise to Luke's audience, but it ought not surprise us. Because we've already learned that God is always the first pursuer. That God pursues us in love before we even know him before we're even interested in him. Verse 4, And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Here's a second surprise. Luke's saying God not only, uh, God, God hears the prayer of the outsider, the seeker. Let me pause here for a minute. How many of you saw the movie Unbroken? How many of you, do you see that? How many read the book? Okay, you probably agree with me. The book has much more in it. Uh, but it's the story of a guy named Louis Zamperini who died last July at age 97. He was a world track uh, class, uh, world, world class track runner who served in World War II and endured over two years in a Japanese prison camp, which is the, the kind of the heart of his story. It's an amazing story. 
Uh, but as the story goes, he and his entire crew of Navy airmen crashed their plane in the Pacific Ocean, ended up spending 47 days, I think it was, drifting in rafts across the Pacific, uh, facing starvation, uh, sharks, uh, almost certain death. In the midst of his deepest desperation, Louis prayed to the God that he did not yet know. Zamperini promised God from that raft that if he spared his life, he would serve him forever. A typical sort of foxhole prayer, only this was a raft prayer on the Pacific. Well, he went on to survive prison camp, horrible torture and all that, and came home only to forget the promise he made to God for a number of years. After the war, he spent several years drifting toward deep alcoholism as a way to deal with the trauma and bitterness he felt. His wife finally got him to attend the Billy Graham crusade in Los Angeles, the first one. I think it was 19, I forget what year it was, early 50s. He resented being there, resisted going there, but he went. The second night he went back, when Graham gave the invitation, Louis suddenly remembered the prayer that he had once prayed to God on the Pacific Ocean. He remembered that he had promised, but he had not fulfilled that promise. So he got up, he responded to the call, he walked forward and received Christ as Lord and Savior. And instantaneously, his life was changed. And that's the part of the story isn't told clearly in the movie. God hears the prayers even of those who do not yet know him. God's message to Cornelius continues. He says, And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He's lodging with one Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. Now, interesting note here. Uh, we know who Simon Peter was. He's the disciple who's become an apostle. But he's staying with a guy also named Simon who's called a tanner. And Jeff and I were talking about this. He may mention it again next week. But uh, this is the only time the profession of being a tanner is mentioned in the whole Bible. It was a, a, a one who, who tanned animal hides and turned them into leather. So in the Jewish way of thinking, this would have been a, kind of a, a distasteful job because he had to be around dead animal bodies, which the Jews saw as unclean. But Peter is staying at this guy's house because God is preparing him already for his encounter with Cornelius the Roman centurion. Verse 7, And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So here we have it. God speaks to Cornelius, the outsider, the Roman, tells him to send men to Joppa to bring back a guy named Peter, who he would have known to be a Jew. Uh, and he gives very specific directions, just like uh, he did with Ananias back in chapter 9. And then Cornelius does exactly what God tells him to do. And that's critical. Uh, back a few years ago, in 2007, our family traveled to uh, Kenya with an FECG short-term team. While we were there, we took a short little two-day safari, just one of the memorable moments in our family life. But while we were there, we met a, I met a young man who called himself Joseph. He was working as kind of a busboy at the safari village. And I noticed as I chatted with him, or as he worked, that he had uh, his earlobes had been pierced and then pulled way out in, into big loops. And I recognized that as possibly make, marking him as one of the Maasai tribesmen uh, because we had visited a, a Maasai village just recently. So I was curious, and I just asked him, uh, do you happen to be Maasai? And he seemed glad that I'd noticed, and he started the conversation. A few minutes later, my boys walked up, and so I introduced them to Joseph. I said, this is Jordan, Jesse, Micah, and Canaan, I said. He shook their hands very politely. Then he looked at Micah, the third one. He said, what was that one's name again? And I said, Micah. He said, like the prophet in the Bible? I said, yes, like the prophet in the Bible. You, uh, have you read the Bible? And he said, yes, I have. I'm a Christian. I said, are you Messiah? He said, he was. And and I asked, would you mind telling me your story, how you as a Maasai tribesman became a Christian? So he told me the story. I'll make it very short. He said he grew up in the Maasai tribe, which is one of the oldest continuous cultures on the face of the earth, believing in one God, the God who created all things. But he didn't know much about that God, he said. But as a young man, he had a series of dreams. The two I remember are, one, he was trying to climb a long ladder into heaven. And each time he tried to climb it, he was told he was not permitted to climb beyond a certain point. He couldn't climb all the way. The other dream involved a light that pursued him. A bright light would pursue him, and he couldn't get away from the light. He even tried to bury himself in the ground in his dream, and the light penetrated right through. He could not avoid the light. Then one day, he said, a Christian Maasai missionary came to his village and began to teach from the Bible. Now, he had never heard of the Bible and never seen a Bible. But within a few days, he said, I began to recognize the stories of the Bible from the dreams that I had had. 
from the stories I'd heard the elders of my village tell. And he came to understand that the way to heaven was Jesus and the light that had been following him was Jesus, light of the world, and he became a Christian. Here Cornelius is an outsider, but he's a seeker. He's praying. God gives him a vision. God speaks and he obeys. But he needs help. He needs help. Act 2 begins now. God speaks to the insider. God has spoken to the outsider. Now he speaks to the insider. Verse 9. The next day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up in the household at about the sixth hour to pray. So Cornelius' messengers are going to get Peter, unbeknownst to Peter. So Peter goes up under his rooftop to pray, and it says at the sixth hour. That's noon, which is also an hour of prayer for the Jews. So notice, Cornelius is praying at the ninth hour. Peter's praying at the sixth hour. God's doing something in both of their hearts. Verse 10. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. Middle of the day, it's noontime. He's hungry. He's praying. Might have been fasting, which uh, tells you why he was hungry. And he falls into what Luke calls a trance. The word is ecstasis, from which we get our word ecstasy. It means a kind of prayer-induced vision. So notice, Cornelius has a vision, God speaks. Peter has a vision, God speaks. Verse 11, and I saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Peter, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I, for I have never eaten, never, never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Got to stop there just for a moment to explain what's going on. You and I, as people who have lived most of our lives in North America, uh, and as we've been North American Christians, we don't tend to think of food in religious terms. Uh, we tend to feel free to eat pretty much anything we find palatable. And we might have a medical reason to avoid a certain food, like a peanut allergy or something like that. We may have certain health reasons to choose a gluten-free diet or a vegetarian diet. But we don't think about food in terms of sin or disobedience to God. Well, except for Brussels sprouts. Personally, I think Brussels sprouts are evil. I found this picture on the internet. I just had to show this picture. There's a long story behind why I feel that way about Brussels sprouts. I won't tell it tonight. But our first century Jews thought of food in religious terms. Way back in the Old Testament, God had given his people certain commands about certain kinds of food as a reminder of his holiness and the fact that they were set apart. For example, they were to avoid eating shellfish or pork because both of those um, uh, uh, creatures uh, consumed human waste, which made them uh, unclean. Now, these laws help define the Jewish people as insiders. So when Peter says, I've never eaten anything, Lord, unclean or common, what he's saying is, that's part of what's made me an insider, God. I followed all the rules. I don't do that. Verse 15, and the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taking, taken up at once into heaven. Now, in Scripture, whenever God says something three times, it's really important. For example, he speaks to young Samuel three times in the Old Testament. He says to Peter three times, do you love me in the New Testament? It means it's really important. Here he says three times, what God has made clean, do not call common. Now, what's going on here? God is shifting the discussion from food laws to people. The ancient Jews, you see, not only regarded certain foods as unclean, but whole groups of people as being unclean as well. Anyone who was not an Orthodox Jew was considered unclean before God and therefore beyond the reach of his blessing and his grace. Have you ever found yourself slipping into the kind of thinking, you know, us and them? You know, we are God's people, God's family, they out there. It's so easy to slip into that kind of thinking. God's telling Peter, not so. God's telling Peter the gospel changes the game. He's telling him that just as Jesus had forgiven him three times for denying him and has made his heart clean again, so also he could clean the heart of a Roman, of a pagan, of an outsider. Are people different? Yes. Are some people lost and spiritually speaking and far from God? Yes, but not in the sense of being unclean, unreachable, or unlovable. Peter is confused and shaken. 
I don't think we can even imagine what it felt like to have his whole world, what he's always believed about himself, about God, about other people, just turn completely upside down. God's telling him it's possible for him to care for and love those he once feared and despised. God's telling him that in Jesus, his love and forgiveness is available, as available to the Roman as it is to him, a Jew. But just as Cornelius, the outsider, needs help, so also Peter, the insider, needs help. Verse 17. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision uh, that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for in Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. Okay, God's uh, sending Peter the help he needs to understand, but the help comes from a surprising source. And Peter went down to the man and said, I am the one you are looking for. What's the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So you get this? Uh, God is using the outsiders. These are also Roman guys who served under Cornelius. God's using them to tell Peter what God wants Peter to do. It's a great story. Verse 23, so he invited them in to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. So Cornelius is so excited to finally get things explained to him that he invites his whole family and all his friends. And aren't, new, aren't people who are new to the gospel often the most excited? They get so excited. I, I've met some people here recently at church with tears in their eyes that I can't believe God led me to this place. I can't believe a place like this exists. This is so amazing. And I'm like, really, here? You know, I'm kind of used to this place. He's excited. And that brings, it brings us to Act 3. The stage is set. Act 3 is God brings the insider and the outsider together. A lot of text here, so follow along. Verse 25. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. He was so glad. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. Peter says essentially, You know, guys, this is a pretty weird thing we're doing here. I really shouldn't be here. And you really shouldn't have me here. But since we're all here, what do you want to know about? And Cornelius said, four days ago at about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. And your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I went for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So God arranges for the apostle, the disciple, the believer, to engage with the seeker and all of his friends. God leads Cornelius to Peter, and God leads Peter to Cornelius. I've heard some call this a divine appointment. God arranging things in some sort of mysterious divine way so that the believer is paired up with the seeker. Think about what God's done here. He's bringing together a Roman centurion who, who serves a pagan emperor who is seen as a spiritual outsider, unclean from traditional Jewish uh, viewpoints. And Peter, a Jewish follower of Jesus, who only months earlier tried to stab a Roman soldier with his own sword in the Garden of Gethsemane. How weird is this meeting? And he brings them together by the power of the gospel and for the purpose of the gospel. I'll tell you a little story is happening right here at FACG right now. It's just one of the many stories happening. Uh, as most of you know, we have a, a food pantry ministry called the Shepherd's Heart at the East Campus. Serve 250 families a month or so there. It's an amazing ministry that a lot of you make possible. Um, Erin Wise, the director of the Shepherd's Heart Food Pantry, knows about the all-time bestseller book club, and she's a part of a group. And she started to become um, curious as to whether the all-time bestseller book club uh, had Spanish, had the Bible in Spanish, because a lot of the clients that come to the food pantry are, uh, speak Spanish. And so she was told they did, and so she got a couple of, of the Spanish sample New Testaments and left them, left them on the table at the food pantry. 
Well, over the next couple of weeks, clients at the food pantry began to notice the Bible, pick it up, look at it, and ask about it. And before long, she had a bunch of these families who wanted to be part of the all-time bestseller book club in Spanish. But we needed a leader who could lead it in two languages. Well, a few months ago, we hired Eli Munoz to come help us with West Campus Worship, and Eli is bilingual, and Eli is now leading our first ever. Five families have signed up to be part of an best, all-time bestseller book club in Spanish because someone came here at the right time that can serve them. I talked to him about it just tonight. That sounds to me kind of like a book of Acts story. That sounds to me kind of like a divine appointment. Like who could have ever seen that coming, right? It's happening here. The story of Acts is how this gospel reaches across boundaries, we are no longer to think of, think of people in terms of insiders and outsiders. The gospel is for all. Now let's move on to the end of the story. Verse 34, so Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent Israel, preaching the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. See what God has done here. In order to reach the outsiders, he had to first reach the insiders. In order to reach Cornelius, God had to reach Peter. And when he reached Peter, he changed Peter's assumptions, he changed Peter's prejudices, and the outsiders were invited in. Verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised, those are the Jews, who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing and speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked him to remain for some days. Sometimes when I'm walking through the uh, uh, checkout line at the grocery store, I like to read the tabloid headlines. I can't help it. I just like to read them sometimes. You know, uh, headlines like a man gives birth or uh, aliens build hotel in Manhattan. I just like, like reading those kinds of things. Well, can you imagine what, 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 the, what the headlines would have been here? Would have been, would have been um, Romans repent. Romans receive the Holy Spirit. Romans are being baptized. It would have read like a tabloid headline. Now, notice it says, the Holy Spirit poured out even on the Gentiles. This made me smile when I read it. I read it a couple times. It makes me smile. It's as if Luke is saying, look at what happened here. The Holy Spirit is poured out even on them. Even on them. Now, that's, that's us. We're the Gentiles. Unless you were born of a Jewish family, you're a Gentile. And Luke is here poking fun at us. Even them. That's us. So shocking. We were once the outsiders, and we think of ourselves now as insiders. Several things we can take away from the story. First, you might be like Cornelius. That is, that is you, 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 you are doing your very best to be religious and devout. Uh, you're doing the right things. You're giving your alms to the poor. You're caring. You're praying, but you've, you don't really know Jesus as Lord and Savior. No one's really explained that to you like the guy in the video. You're like Cornelius. You're seeking, but you don't really know him. You need someone like Peter to explain and help you understand. That's what we're here for. You could talk to me tonight or anyone tonight. We'd like to help you understand and come to know who Jesus is in your life. Or, as my guess is, most of us here tonight are more, a little bit more like Peter. And if we're more like Peter... Here's, I think, what God says to us. He would like us to think about our assumptions and our prejudices. He would like for us to think about whether or not there are people that we just tend to regard as unclean, unreachable outside. Because, surprisingly, those are the very people he calls us to go to and be with. Think about that. 
Is there a divine appointment for you somewhere in the next few days? Would you be willing to pray and ask, Lord, I confess, sometimes I see people as outsiders. Just too out there, too different, unreachable, unclean. Maybe you're asking me to be willing to go there, to go to that house, to go to that person, so that I might be the bridge they walk across to you. Peter prayed. Peter listened to God. Peter allowed God to turn his prejudices and assumptions upside down. And then he went to Cornelius' house, shared the good news, and what happened? The Holy Spirit took over. And that's our prayer. Would you bow with me tonight as I close? Lord God, I thank you for this wonderful story. Two men so different from one another. In a million years would never be in the same room, yet so important to each other. And how you led them together, really for our sake and the sake of the gospel in the world. Grant us the spiritual courage to listen to you, to be willing to follow you, and to be used to reach out to those who are looking for you. It's in your name that we pray.